Thank you, Joe, and uh, very pleased to be here this evening. Um, so we're going to do a quiz. So Joe said a word several times. Um, Gil, how do you spell it? G-I-L-D. What? G-I-L-D. How do you spell it, Gil? What does the U stand for? Anybody? Anybody. Euler? Unicode? Unicode. Yes. Oh. <laughs> how many people know about Unicode? Good. Okay. Um, how many people know what BMP stands for? Okay. For those who don't, it's going to be a mystery. <laughs> okay. Before we um, begin the main presentation about the Ken Mincho typeface. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about Unicode. And it seems like almost every year I try to put together um, a list. And this list is about Unicode and why it's more than just the BMP. So BMP is actually plane zero of how many planes? 15, 17. So we have planes one through 16 in addition to plane zero, which is the BMP. And how many of those 16 planes actually have characters encoded in them, excluding PUA? Three? You're kind of wavering between two and three. 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 OK, and actually a fourth one is going to be opening up really soon. We'll be talking about that. OK, so anyway, um, so every, every year or so I like to put together these top 10 lists. And everybody knows what a top 10 list is, right? <laughs> David Letterman and all that. Um, so this one, it's why support beyond BMP code points. Why do you want to support code points in those 16 additional planes? Why, why would a developer even want to do that? So um, this is the 2018 edition of this top 10 list. So here we have 1 through 10. So number 10. Um, for those familiar with Japanese, uh, the current Joyo kanji set, which has 2,136 2, characters, all kanji, requires one ideograph or kanji in extension B, this one. Number nine, the latest GIST standard 0213 requires 303 extension B kanji. That's actually above and beyond the one that's required for Joyo kanji. Number eight, moving over to China. Uh, GB18030 certification, for those who are familiar with that, what that process is, if you want to do that without private use area code points, it requires six extension B ideographs. Number seven, also with China, in 2013, they published a list of uh, 8,105 ideographs, and 196 of those are found in extensions B through E. Moving over to Hong Kong, their current standard requires 1,704 extension B and C ideographs. Number five, if you want to support the ideographic variation database, you need to use the 240 variation selectors that are in plane 14. Okay, so we've already mentioned uh, plane, well, I didn't mention explicitly, but extensions B through E are in plane 2. The variation selectors are in plane 14. So we've covered two of the four that we referenced. And as of Unicode version 6, which was published in 2010, eight years ago, there are now more characters outside the BMP, and that number is increasing with every version. Now, plane one, almost all emoji and all new ones are encoded in plane one. Let me get down to the wire here, number two. Extension G, which is currently in process, is going to be in plane three. So we've actually covered all four of the planes. 
though, extent, uh, though Plan 3 is not officially open for business, but it's going to be um, perhaps as early as Unicode 12, but my money would be on Unicode 13. Okay, and now we get to number one. Any guesses? Adlum. Huh? <laughs> Adlum. Uh, oh. The BMP is effectively full. As of version 10, there's only 1,760 reserved code points. It's kind of scattered about everywhere. And that's it. You can all go home now. <laughs> uh, okay, I always like to do that one. Okay, so the the main reason why you're here, it's not for that uh, the Unicode stuff, but um, a couple years ago, one of our typeface designers, Ryoko Nishizuka, started working on a project called Pen Mincho. And this is a new typeface design for Japanese, and it's inspired by this cute creature that you see on your screen. Does anybody know what that is? So you're really, really close. It's a Martin. M A R T E N. And it's pronounced, it's called is Ten. Is his last name Durst? What? Ten Durst. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not, not, not loud enough. Um, some people will get that joke. Um, it's, but interesting. it's interesting that you said ferret because um, I was, I'm very interested in this for um, many reasons. 30 years ago when I started studying Japanese, um, one day when I came home, I was living with my parents, it was very cost effective. Um, I stopped at the pet store and I bought a ferret, brought it home. And my mom thought I bought her pet home, of course. And uh, pretty soon uh, we had two ferrets. And at some point I had to move out of the house. My parents took care of the ferrets and they kept buying more. <laughs> and I, th I think at, at one time, I think they had upwards of five of these things running around the house. But um, they, their lifespan is about six years, um, and they just eventually stop. But um, that's kind of part of my history is the, uh, the ferrets, and very uh, memorable. So the title of the presentation is Ten Mincho, uh, boldly go where no Japanese font has gone before, and I'll explain why that's the case for Ten Mincho. Um, it does things that um, typical Japanese fonts have never done. But first, um, um, I, I should also warn you that this presentation is going to be laced with. <laughs> like um, for those familiar with the blog article that I published on the CJK Type Blog, um, they're all there. Um, but these are high resolution versions. So um, we're going to talk about the first statistics of Tenman Show. So the typeface name in uh, English is Ten Mincho, and in, Jap in Japanese it's written right here, Ten, which is the Martin, and Mincho, which is the typeface style. The typeface designer, um, who by the way is on this Connect session watching me do this, um, <laughs> is Ryoko Nishizuka. She has been at Adobe in the type team there in, uh, uh, for upwards of 20 years. So she is a very um, skilled typeface designer, um, and this is her latest uh, project. Uh, we released Ten Min Show on November 28th during Max Japan late last year, um, but uh, work on Ten Min Show started uh, about all, well over a year, probably about a year and a half before we released it. The number of glyphs is just over 9,000, and uh, more recently, I've been working on these pan CJK fonts, and they just have a god awful number of glyphs, 65,000. So it's kind of nice to get back to these, you know, kind of normal fonts that have a reasonable number of glyphs, several thousand. <laughs> and uh, the first thing that makes Ten Men Show unique among Japanese fonts is that there's two faces. So there's a regular, so the, the upright, and a tail. And uh, typical Japanese fonts uh, do not have a separate italic face. So that's the first thing that makes Ten Min Show unique among Japanese fonts. Um, also, because there's a large number of uh, Latin glyphs 
in Tendential. We have a large number of open type features. We have 32 G sub features, which is glyph substitution. And we have seven G pods, which is glyph positioning, like turning different types of metrics. And anybody who's familiar with um, these open type features will immediately recognize that 32 is a lot <coughs> to have in a font. I'm not sure if it's a record, probably not, but for a typical Japanese font, it's, it's a large number. Um, and this is a sample that I put together um, showing the 10 inch oak lifts, the, the kana and the kanji. And don't worry, I'll be making these uh, presentation slides available uh, almost immediately after the presentation so you can check all this stuff out. Okay. Uh, this is uh, going to be very technical for people who are not familiar with fonts. Um, but the, the glyph set for Tenminshu is based on what we refer to as the Adobe Identity Zero ROS. And ROS stands for Registry Ordering and Supplement, which is something that we use in CID keyed fonts, which are typical for East Asian. And Adobe Identity Zero is our special purpose ROS. So we've used this um, in fonts before. The earliest use or the earliest commercial use is Kazadaki, also designed by Ryoko. And I believe about was it nine years ago, I gave a presentation about Kazadaki for iMark. So we've used it for that um, script-like typeface. And we've also used it for the Source Han and Noto CJK families, which we released in 2014 and 2017. So um, we've been very successful, and uh, I also use it for 10 show. And in addition to that, I'm using um, Unicode-based working glyph names. So for example, the, the kanji 410, which is U plus HCA2, the glyph name is Uni HCA2. And I pretty much extended this to all of the glyphs uh, in the font. And it makes developing the font a much more reliable and predictable process. And I first did that approach for the source on and Noto CJK families, which was necessary because when you're dealing with um, 65,000 glyphs, you need some way to manage it in a very efficient manner. And again, we're going back to the, the U in the word guilt, Unicode. Okay, and uh, another thing that makes, well, it doesn't make Kenmin show special, but um, typical Japanese fonts will include glyphs for kanji, the video class. And in Tenmin show, we have a somewhat um, smaller number of kanji glyphs than a typical Japanese font would include. Um, the, the exact number is 6,469. And this is effectively a union of the first just standard X0208. Um, we had to make sure that we include all of the Joyo kanji, the latest ones, and also the Jimeyo kanji, which are used for personal names. And we added, I think, I think it was like four additional little bonus kanji in there. Um, I, I mentioned a couple of them in the blog article. And uh, what, what makes Tenmin show unique is that all of the kanji are encoded. So we did not include any unencoded variants. So everyone you can get to directly through a code. And this, this simply makes the font easier to use. And another thing about the, uh, the kanji is that we're following the GIST 2004 style, which is considered the latest and greatest style in Japan. And the, the kanji that you see at the bottom of the screen are the ones um, that had to be um, the GIST 2004 style. And a lot of them will appear to be um, traditional. They'll use traditional components as opposed to the simplified. For example, if you look at Radical 162, you see they all have two dots, for example. <laughs> okay, we're going to be back to Unicode again. Uh, the Unicode coverage. So these are some uh, excerpts from the Unicode tables for Tinman Show. So the, the one on your left shows the basic uh, ASCII and the extended Latin. Um, uh, the next one shows some additional Latin, and the third one shows even more Latin. So you have things like all the uh, things you need for Vietnamese. Um, down here we have the ones that you need for pinyin. So we have a uh, fairly broad um, Latin coverage in uh, Tenmin Show. And this is uh, 
you don't usually find this in Japanese fonts. And the one on the left is the same one on the previous slide, except it's the italic. So we can see all the glyphs here are italic. And uh, this shows you the, the, the hiragana katakana, some symbols, and this shows you the first um, 256 block of kanji. So this kind of gives you an example of you know, what the Unicode coverage looks like in the font. Okay, uh, I, I mentioned the rich Latin support um, early on, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit. So um, the Latin glyphs actually came from a different typeface that was designed simultaneously with Ten Mincho called Ten Old Style. And this was designed by Robert Slumbach. Um, he's been at Adobe now over 30 years. He's our principal typeface designer. So he worked very closely with Ryoko to come up with a, a Latin design that works well with the, the kana and the kanji that Ryoko was uh, designing. And they had a lot of interaction, a lot of back and forth. Um, there were some last minute changes that Ryoko asked Robert to do. And um, they're all reflected in 10 Old Style, which was released separately as uh, four separate weights, regular, medium, semi-bold, and bold. Um, so 10 Mincho only uses one of the weights of 10 Old Style. Even though we call it regular, it's not necessarily the same regular that we um, shipped as 10 Old Style. And another thing about this, about 10 Old Style, is Every glyph in 10 old style, every one, is included in 10 minship. So nothing was left out. And that's why it has very rich Latin support. So this is an example of the, the regular. Um, sorry, I, I kind of modified that a little bit. Um, so that shows the, the regular, the upright. Um, this shows you the italic. And another thing that's going to kind of jump out at you is going to be, we also have the uh, small caps. So these are genuine small caps, not the ones that are just synthesized and all that. These are genuine small caps in the font, accessible through the appropriate open type features. And we also have various digits. So um, <coughs> the default digits in 10 Mincho are the lining and proportion. So lining means that they all have the same uniform height and the proportional, meaning that the, the one is, for example, going to be narrower than the nine of the zero. And same for italic. Those are the default. And we also have, for both upright and italic, we have the tabular. So on this one, the digits have the same width. We also have the old style for both upright and italic. But then when we get to other variations, we only have upright. For example, that's the small cap figures. Those are the half width. And there's a reason why I'm using two. I, I repeat every one because we also have full width that take up the same space as two of the half width. So that's that's the coverage that we have for digits in uh, the Ten Mincho. I love that. Anyway, um, okay, so the, these are the 32 open type features that we have um, in the fonts, uh, 32 G sub uh, 7 G pause. And the ones that I um, colored, I guess marked the color, um, these, are the, these are the features that are typically um, used with the Latin glyphs, you know, like subscript, superscript. Um, you know, the, the things for all the digits. Uh, there's a stylistic set here for handling the digits and some currency symbols. Um, and then <coughs> I mentioned that we have the regular and italic as separate fonts for Tin Mincho. Um, and also because we do not have italic small caps, um, and also because the italic glyphs are default in the italic face. These four features are not present in the italic face because they're not necessary. They don't do anything. So those have been um, removed from the italic face. And these are these are not G sub features that are actually in Ten Minsho. These are G sub features that are typically found in a Japanese font. 
So this, uh, for example, if you want to get to just 78, perhaps you use this one. If you want to get to just 83, um, if, you, if your font is just 2004 by default, you can get to just 90 bits using this traditional form and so on. But because all the kanji in Tenminshu are encoded, there's actually no reason to include them, so we did um, The only one that you can actually make a good case for maybe is uh, this one here, uh, PRID for traditional form, because some of them are encoded just more of a convenience mechanism to get them through a feature. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the italic. So the italic um, is a separate style link italic base. So when I say style link, what I mean is that if you open, you use the font in an application that uses style linking like Microsoft Word, um, you type in the text, you then there's a button that has for italic, just like there's a button for bold. So you press the italic and it'll actually style link to the italic base without actually selecting it as a separate font. So that's typical for, for Western fonts to style link the italic face, and we've done that in Pen Show. Um, but if you're using the regular face, the non-italic one, there's also an open type feature, um, which is tag I-T-A-L, short for italic, um, that you can uh, use to uh, access the italic lips. So there's two ways to get to the italic lips. One is um, through the separate italic face or through a G sub feature. And I believe the only app that provides a convenient way to access this feature is Adobe InDesign. Kind of get ahead of myself. Okay, so in total, there's 800, 833 italic glyphs in Pen and Show. These all come from uh, Pen Old Style. Um, 595 of these are directly encoded, the other ones are not encoded but they're accessible through features. So this would be, for example, the different types of uh, figures that I showed you, the, um, the old style, the, the tabular. Those are, the, those are among the unencoded ones because you have to use a feature to access them. And also, as I mentioned before, there's no small cap italics, although some fonts may include them. Um, 10 min show does not because 10 old style does not. Um, one thing that uh, we, we were able to do with the 10 um, Mincho that we've done with NCJK fonts, the uh, Source Han and Noto CJK families, is uh, build an open type collection. And uh, open type collections are very convenient if the glyph set is shared among more than one of the fonts in the family. And because 10 Mincho both faces use the same set of glyphs, meaning that the italic and glyphs are actually baked in within the same glyph set. Um, you can actually uh, share the glyph set among the two fonts. We do that as a collection. Um, as separate open type fonts, they're about four megabytes each. So, you know, typical 9,000 glyphs, four megabytes, that all makes sense. Um, if we make an open type collection, still only four megabytes because they use the same glyph set, the same set of glyphs. And the glyphs in a font, especially a CJK font, is the 800 pound gorilla, meaning that it's gonna, that takes up like upwards 95 or more percent of the font. So if, if the fonts share the same glyph set, um, you can build a multi-head collection and um, save space. So this is really just a space-saving measure. And uh, as I already mentioned, SourceHan and the Noto CJK families um, use this as one of their deployment formats because they share the same glyph set across the regions that are supported. Um, there are some system requirements, though, if you want to use open tech collections for, uh, for Mac OS version 10.8. I forget what that is. Some kind of cat. Uh, it's, uh, mountain lion. <laughs> yeah, mountain lion. Okay, yeah, right, mountain lion. Um, for Windows, it's version 1607 and up. Does anybody know what 1607 is? Creators update. Anniversary update. Windows 10. 
And for Adobe Apps, uh, regardless of which OS you're using, um, if you're using CS6, which is ancient and up, uh, they will work. And the OpenType collection will be available soon um, through FontSpring. It's not available yet. Um, okay, language sensitive features. And other things get curious. Um, so, there's a class of um, characters that are used for both Western and Japanese use. And the ones that um, I think are the highest <coughs> frequency are the smart words. The single ones on the left and the double ones on the right. And in Penguin Show and for typical Japanese fonts, they use proportional, just like Western. Okay. But if you language tag the text for Japanese, which some apps like InDesign can do, browsers can do, for example, um, you can actually include different glyphs for these characters in the font. Can anybody see the difference? The top lines level in the Japanese. That's your hand. The lines of the end box. Yeah. So these little registration marks kind of show you where the top and bottom of the um, end box are located. So uh, in a typical Western font, um, they're aligned to the cap height. They work well with the caps. But that doesn't necessarily work well for CJK characters, you know, the Kana, Kanji, and so on. So in this case, we have to have separate versions that are slightly higher aligned to the M box because the Kanji are aligned to the M box. So we get a much better um, uh, usage for this. And the, the first typefaces that we developed that actually do this were the source on and of those CJK ones, the fan CJK. And so we simply decided those are a very good technique, so we employed it in the pen show typefaces as well. And because some people like full width, um, we also have these full width versions of all four that take up the full M. And you can get to the full width list using this particular G sub feature, F. WID, which stands for full width. And we have some additional um, characters in the font that have different default <coughs> widths. So the, two, the top first two lines are proportional by default. The top is uh, what you see in the regular face, the bottom one is the italic. And the third line are characters whose widths are full width by default. But again, if you open up InDesign, grab this text, and then language tag it for Japanese, they all become full width. So the last line stays the same because they were already full width by default. This line here, whether it's regular or italic, we found they all become full width. So you can force um, you can force the full width by either language tagging these characters as Japanese, or you can also use this G sub feature to force it. If you don't, if you use an app that doesn't support the uh, language tag, and likewise, if you language tag the text for English, these full width ones will now become proportional, either upright or italic, depending on which face you're using. So for all for all of these 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 characters, we have both forms, and there's different defaults. But then you can um, get to either one either through language tagging or through features. And please don't ask how we decide which ones are default. Very complex process. Okay, uh, uh, another thing that makes um, Tim and Show very um, cute. Um, <laughs> but the SVG glyphs. Anybody know what SVG stands for? Something vector graphics. Scalable. There you go. Scalable. Okay, so um, so a lot of Japanese fonts uh, have uh, glyphs for these characters, right? So we have we have uh, black sun, um, cloud, this means kind of rain. Okay. Snowman, pointing hands, and we haven't had this smiling. What uh, what 
and post and, post and, post and even this thing, you know, some kind of Japanese poem symbol. Anyway, um, so Ryoko decided to have a little bit of fun. So in in Ten Mincho, um, she designed uh, <laughs> special glyphs for these characters. So here, this is this is a snowman like mark, Japanese style umbrella. Um, she would have to explain those, you know. But anyway, yeah, clouds in the sun, a little cloud in front of it. And then I love these, the ham. And then look at this. You got the ears. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, not, not, but it will get to that one. And this is the best part. <laughs> if you select, or if you type in the, the kanji that means Martin or Ten, and you select the alternates, these come up. <laughs> what, does that, what does that look like? Uh, okay. So there's a, there's a backstory here. So um, at the end of, I think Ryoko's, Ryoko's still on. Um, at the end of 2016, she shared with me um, these glyphs. And they came in the following order. Um, it was this one, but it was reversed. Okay. Then it was this one. Looks like an O. Then it was this one. And it was this one. That was the order. So when I looked at these, I immediately noticed, gosh, these look like letters. They spell something, except just reverse this one. It look, sort of looks like an E if you reverse it. So um, so she took my advice. We, it, these ones actually stayed the same. We didn't have to touch those at all. We, I just ordered them differently in the font, so they actually come up in this order. Um, but she did take my advice. She then flipped the last one, the E, and it, yeah, now it spells love. So um, that's sort of a little uh, Easter egg that we put into the font. Okay, but there, there, there's something wrong. Um, these aren't SVG glyphs, right? What makes SVG glyphs special? What can SVG do? Oh. Color. Color. Mm. Gradients. Animation. We didn't do the second two, but um, but we did color. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's where this one comes in. Um, comes in a red. Postal mark is red. The rest is still black and white. But then we color all the other ones. Like that. Yeah, my favorite is still the snowman. <laughs> okay, this is going to be another technical part. Um, does anybody here know what a variation sequence is? Like two people. Okay, so if you want to get some snacks while we talk about this. Um, okay, so anyway, Unicode has this thing called a variation sequence where there's a base character and you can follow it with a variation selector and then that will, if the font supports it, it'll the font can then present a different version of the character, usually of some kind of variant of it. So um, in Tenmin Show, we have, um, in order to support the Jinmeyo kanji set properly, um, I believe there's 57 of those that are CJK compatibility ideographs. And I think Mike McKenna can tell you why there is a problem with CJK compatibility ideographs. Why if you copy and paste it, it may not stay the same. So if you look at, if you compare this line, which are the base characters, so these are the ones that are Unified video graphs. Yeah, open your eyes. Um, this is what the, the, C the, the corresponding CJK compatibility ideographs look like. So, for example, if you copy all this text here and then paste it somewhere else, they may end up looking like this. So you effectively lost the information. Okay? Luckily, um, variation sequences allow you to preserve that. So the, the first way that you can preserve it is that there's an IBD collection called the WJAPAN-1, and we register IBSs, these are ideographic variation sequences, that correspond to these characters. So the actual text here, I'm not sure if it's going to copy correctly out of the PDF presentation, but 
when I prepared this, I actually used the Adobe Japan One IBSs. And so if you copy this and paste it somewhere that has a font that includes these IBSs, it'll be preserved. You'll still get this. Won't get the other way to do this <laughs> is Adobe, uh, sorry, Unicode also has standardized variation sequences for all of these compatibility characters. So Tenmin Show allows you to represent these characters either using Adobe Japan One IBSs like I had in the previous slide or these standardized variation sequences. And even though it's a different sequence, you use the same base character, um, they all point to the same glyph. So this is just something that we baked into the font. Uh, just this is based on you know latest practice, latest good practice for handling these uh, troublesome compatibility characters. So uh, uh, you can get more information about Tenmin Show. Um, we have it available on TypeKit for both web and desktop use. Um, we've also written um, a TypeKit blog article that's in English and Japanese, and also there's a CJK type blog article also in English and Japanese. So when you get this presentation, I'll send out the link. Um, these are actually links. This will take you to type, the TypeKit page, the English page, English page, Japanese, Japanese for more information. <laughs> and that's our Martin going away. Okay. And if anybody, if you, actually if you want to, that's the, um, that's the shortened URL for this presentation. If you want to grab it right now. And that's actually my last slide. Well, Ken, you have to tell us more about Martins now. Okay, thank you. Um, if anybody has any questions, either in the room or online, you know, for those who are on Connect, if you have a question or comment, let's do that one at a time because I'm the only person who's looking at it. <laughs> I'll try and help. With that. Okay. So, if if you don't mind, I have two questions, Ken. One, the, about the... Uh, One at a time, please. About the variation sequences. So there are now two variation sequences for specifying the same character. Did I understand correctly? Uh, there's actually three. Three. So if I'm doing searching and, and the like, um, can you say a little bit about, is there a normalization? For, uh, for that, these, that, or how do we address that? That's really interesting because um, I was reviewing a paper for a journal um, yesterday and today that actually talked about these variation sequences. And um, this person who wrote the article was talking about how the browsers have different behavior for these. For example, if, if, you, if you copy one of these things and uh, my memory is going to be really bad here, but I think you get consistent behavior in Chrome and Safari in that when it does the search, it ignores the variation selector and searches based on the base gear. So which means that if you do a search for this first, if you do a search for this, you'll find this, this, and this. And you'll be able to find the compatibility character because it, it normalizes everything when it does the search. Um, but Firefox is treating these variation sequences like a graphene cluster, which means that if you copy this thing and search for it, uh, uh, sorry, this is a here. You copy the search for it, it'll find only this. It won't find that or that. So there, there is different behavior for searching in different implementations. And if I had to say which one was correct, I'd say that Chrome and Safari is doing it right. <laughs> Okay. I didn't say it because you're in the room. I, I could see arguments both ways, but okay. And then, so the, the other question is, it used to be the case um, that if you had an English application with a certain size font, that when you were translating to Japanese, you would increase the font size by a couple points um, because you needed the legibility um, because of the detail in the, in the kanji characters and so forth. And so now with these fonts and improvements in um, 
font support and, and graphics. Is there is that recommendation still the right recommendation, or can you keep the same font size, or what's the relationship there? Are you talking about dealing with multiple fonts or the Latin glyphs inside the Japanese font? Um, dealing with the change in language and simply having the readability of the Japanese once it's translated. That, that's actually one of the reasons why it's good to have fonts like Pen Mencho that have a fully functional Latin component because the Latin glyphs are then scaled in proportion so that they work better with the Japanese text. I mean, keep in mind, this is a Japanese font, which means if you're going to modify one of the scripts in the font, you're not going to want to, you don't want to wag the, ta the dog by the tail. Because yeah, I, but I, I think that's a different aspect of the question. If if I have a um, ten point font in English and then I translate to Japanese, or the older fonts anyway, ten point kanji might not give you the legibility to distinguish some of the characters um, from each other. It has nothing to do with with ASCII. It's just that the size wasn't enough, and so. The recommendation was to increase the font size. It, it, it's fully dependent on the fonts that you're dealing with, whether you need to do that or not. In the case of the Source Han and Noto CJK families and with Pen Mincho, we've had to um, scale the Western glyphs to work better with the CJK words. Okay, thank you. And I think we have uh, some questions in the Connect, which we'll try to take. Not yet. What? That's just David saying he's on to Hawaii time, so he's okay. an hour late. So we'll take another okay. question in the room then. Uh, over here? Or over here? Um, Want to wait for it? Jump microphone. Mm -hmm. Anybody have a question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you know what Ryoko's inspiration for the actual shape of the fonts are, like the, the artistic inspiration? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a designer, so it's hard for me to. Channel Ryoko here, but I think she was trying to make um, the glyphs look cute, <laughs> you know, sort of mysterious, cute, mischievous. So that's uh, in the marketing material that we have, for example, on the Typekit blog. Um, that's how we describe uh, the way the typeface um, was inspired. And also, the, the Martin in Japan is, is a mischievous animal. So, yeah. oh, she succeeded. Yeah. Really cool looking pot. Good Thank question. You. Now you have two questions in there. Oh. Not really a question, but he says, my, my colleague in our Tokyo office, who's actually Ryoko's manager, said, I guess that when you encounter a Martin when you are hunting, I guess you will have, you will just have your hat off and leave the place. Is this guess correct? Um, yeah. So I believe they're endangered. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question we have here. What prompted the wider Latin support for Ken Mincho? Did Japanese users want to see that, or was it so there was better harmony when using English and Japanese glyphs, or both? Um, I wouldn't say the I wouldn't say that the Latin glyphs are wider. They're just scaled up a very small amount, simply so that they work better with the Japanese glyphs, the kana and the kanji. Um, the fonts do include the full width Latin. That's not really, you would not want to use that in Latin text because it's, it's fairly ugly and uh, it's mainly there for compatibility reasons. Hopefully that answers the question. Let's take another one in the room. There's a the mic. Oh, right here and then back there. Okay. We're next. Um, so the, your font has you know, many, many different features and that gives uh, designers and users lots of flexibility to turn on and off whatever they want. Um, how do you feel, uh, or are there any facilities to turn on and off the color glyphs so you don't get the color? Like if you have a page, 
maybe having a single color glyph in the middle of it isn't. I am anyway. glad you asked. Okay, um, you know what the stylistic set features are? Okay, so um, we have not yet deployed Tin Min Show with the SVG table. There's reasons we, we haven't done so, but I can't say why here. Um, but once we do deploy Tin Min Show with an SVG table, um, the color glyphs, I mean, if you type the characters that correspond to the color glyph, they will be colored by default in applications that support SVG font. Uh, in design, uh, illustrator, um, things like that. Um, but if you want to force the, the black and white presentation, there's actually two ways to do that. One way is that um, the name, the stylistic sets features in a font are typically named. Okay? Um, I forget what this one is. Uh, this one here is Martin. It's, just, it's another way to get to, the, to those four special glyphs. Um, the name of this SS03 feature is black and white. So you can kind of guess what it does. But um, we did mention variation sequences. Um, okay. okay. Um, Unicode has another type of variation sequence called an emoji variation sequence that lets you select either um, text style, which is black and white, or emoji style variations or yeah, text style representation. So which one is default depends on your font. So in Pen Mincho, of course, it's, you know, we want to have the color ones exposed because those are more fun, more exciting. But um, some of these characters have emoji variation sequences defined. You know, both types, the, the text and emoji. Um, the ones that are supported are uh, these first four and this one. Okay, don't ask me why these ones are supported. Okay. <laughs> well, actually, and it's, I think it's this one, but the one, the one pointing up has an emoji variation sequence, actually two of them. These ones do not, these ones do not as well. Actually, no, this, this one does. This one definitely doesn't. Um, they can't see where you're pointing on the webcam. Yeah, I know that. So, <laughs> anyway, um, for those on the webcast, sorry, sorry, you can't see my finger on the screen. Um, the first four, which are the, the, the sun, the cloud, the umbrella, and the, uh, the snowman, um, I'm kind of pointing on it right now. Those have the emoji variation sequences. The up pointing hand has one, and I think this last one on the color line does as well. So those ones, at least, um, you can use variation sequences to force the black and white. And I actually had a proposal to add emoji variation sequences for these other ones. Um, I don't think I can make a good case for the postal code um, base. And there's really no way to handle the, the four Martin shapes as these emoji variation sequences. At least not easily. Does that answer your question? And we have two back here now. Thank you. So I think you, my question was answered when you flipped through the GSUB features, but are there uh, any vari uh, vertical versus horizontal variations at all? Yeah, there, was, uh, there should have been any. Yeah, we have the typical vertical features. Yeah. Okay. So okay. In, the, um, in the fourth column of the G sub, the VERT, that's your standard vertical feature. The VRT2 is included there mainly for some weird compatibility. Um, uh, that feature has effectively been deprecated, so applications should not use that. We won't talk about text edit. Um, also, the the GPOS features have some vertical ones as well. So anything that starts with a the V um, is for vertical. 
Does anybody know something or realize something weird when you look at these two lists? Any duplicates? Vert. Yeah. And we've actually implemented the vert feature um, as GSUB and GPUBS. And the, the reason is really, really complicated. I need a really fancy diagram, which I, that I didn't make, so I'm, I'm not going to go into that. But um, very few environments actually support this GPOS feature, the VERT. But we put it in there um, for future use so that when applications do support it, um, uh, it'll work correctly. And, and that applies to the Latin variations as well? No. Okay. Uh, this is all new to me. I don't know a lot about the details of topography, but can I think about these on web pages? First of all, does it make sense for these fonts to be used on web pages? And second of all, how many of these features are available through web page? Is it CSS or do you need another more sophisticated application than just a web browser? Actually, I think web browsers are the ones that are best equipped today to handle these things. And I mean, right now, for the locale feature, this is so you can language tag the text for Japanese or English and get those subtly different glyphs. Um, there's two type of, types of applications that support language tagging today. One is Adobe InDesign. Um, that's for you know kind of high-end authoring. The other one is uh, modern browsers. They support language tagging and that uh, LFCL feature. And I, I think um, you can actually select any of these features. And is that done through CSS? I believe so. Thank you. Um, so back in the webcast, we had a question about uh, what prompted the wider Latin support in Tenmencho. Uh, the Japanese users want to see that, or was it so there was better harmony when using English and Japanese Webster or both? I'm feeling deja vu. David did start answering that right in there. Oh, okay. <laughs> Gotta scroll. So David said wider in this case means a much larger set of characters. Oh, okay. And then he says, Japanese users ask for both Roman and Italic. And Taro chimed in, when a Japanese font is used, it should be useful also for using it for typing in English. OK, yeah, so I completely misunderstood what uh, wider meant. I was thinking shapes. Sorry about that. And David uh, made sure to correct that for you. No worry. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? In that chat? Yeah, Sherry has one new question. How do you ensure the stroke spacing proportions when a typeface involving thousands of glyphs? Uh, do you employ some type of algorithm? I can't imagine manually checking the proportion of every single character. P.S. Love Ryoko's Martin glyphs. Smiley, smiley, smiley. <laughs> and Ryoko said thanks to Sherry. Um, that's about the Martin glyphs. Uh, <laughs> I think the answer, uh, the, the, the question here is that um, CJK fonts have glyphs that um, are inside an M box, but they don't completely fill the M box. There's a small little breathing space around them. And the amount of breathing space around them gives you the breathing space between the glyphs when you put all the characters together. And that space is going to be dependent on what the typeface is used for, you know, how much breathing room you want. But the, the important thing is to be consistent throughout the typeface. And that's really the, the designer's job is to make sure that that is consistent throughout the glyph set. Not sure if that answered the question, but um, that's my understanding. Someone have a question over here? Oh. Oh, not me. This is okay. <laughs> there you are. Thanks for your presentation. Although it is a, a bit, not a bit too technical for me, uh, but I was doing my assignment using InDesign yesterday, and I found out 
not all fonts support different character styles. Like if I want to use to make title bold and the uh, the passage not bold, I have to choose a font font that supports both bold and regular. Why it is so hard to implement different styles to different fonts? Because it seems to me it's so easy. Just make it bigger. Uh, I want to know the reason. Well, the, the first problem there is the number of glyphs you have to design. I mean, you know, there's there's 9,000 um, glyphs in Pentisha. You know, a good a good number of them, like 1,500, are coming from Tenosa, which were already designed. Um, but uh, Ryoko decided that this would be a single weight family. So it could just be one weight regular, and that's it. And even though Ten Old Style was released as four weights, um, we incorporated the glyphs only from one weight of Ten Old Style. That was a design, designer decision. Um, in the case of our Pan CJK fonts, um, we designed the weight extremes. We designed the extra light master and the heavy, and we then interpolated to get five intermediate weights. So with those fonts, you actually have seven different ways to choose from, from extra light all the way to heavy. So it really it really depends on the typeface, you know, what the designer decides to do. Um, if it's a display typeface, it's very common to be just a single weight. But if it's going to be a more what more commonly used you know, for text and other purposes, you then have the broader range of weights. So I think the answer is designer prerogative. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Something else in this row? You're looking like I'm going to hit them with it, so I guess I'll take it away again. <laughs> uh, Roger? Speaking of designer prerogative, uh, how did you, the designer or whoever decide to add that part alternation mark at the end? You know the one I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. Why? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I can't tell you. Okay. <laughs> I have a question. You have a question over there. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, can you please go back to a slide that would illustrate the cuteness factor <laughs> of Ten Min Cho? Forgive me if I am uh, just not clear on, like, if you go I mean, to one that has I mean, base... cute, cuteness for the actual glyphs, like the kana and the kanji, or the, the martin? We got the martin. I got the martin. <laughs> got it. <laughs> it's the, yeah, the characters. Um, Maybe it was in the slide with the base characters and the variations of that show? I think this is better. Okay, okay, so. Because this shows both the kana, or the hiragana, and the kanji. And forgive me because I, I don't read the script. So these are all the ten, these are all ten min show that I'm looking at right here. Well, except for birth statistics at the top. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, um, can we see a slide that shows the uh, Ten Min Cho next to the old style? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't make that. Yeah, I don't have those. I don't think I have anything together. <laughs> well, I mean, this sort of does it, but but yeah, that's not what you want. Um, what I recommend you do, if you want to see that, um, I believe that the Typekit blog article for Ten Man Show has samples like that. That shows. And what was on the screen that had base styles and then uh, two variations? Was that was that showing? Was that all Ten Man Show? Which one? or none? Uh, keep going. So the Chinese and the Japanese. I think the compatibility ideograph slide at presenter. That's sort of cool. Well, keep, not oh, uh, keep going. 
Oh, go back. There, there. So what are we looking at here? Forgive me, because I can't read it. Oh, uh, yeah, you have to... Well, what I recommend you do is come up here and look really close. I, <laughs> I actually found some that I can see the difference, but I don't know... Yeah, so basically, these two lines are going to look the same because they, they reference the same glyphs, but through different mechanisms. Um, the ones, the, the top two lines under base characters, those are different. So you might notice that there might there, be, there may be some strokes missing mm -hmm. where they're present here. Right, like the third fr third from the left on the bottom of yeah. the two, I see a difference if oh, yeah. I look down. And so uh, are all of these ten minutes or none? Okay. They're all ten minutes. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. That's what I'm Just asking. that in, in Unicode, um, these ones are encoded as unified ideographs. Uh, they, they should all be in the DMP. Um, these ones are in the compatibility block, which is near the end of the DMP. Um, and uh, the reason why we have to have these, you know, variation sequence mechanisms is because um, compatibility characters are affected by normalization, which means that if you copy and paste this stuff too many times. Um, Normalization will convert these into these, and you lose that distinctiveness that you wanted. Because I mean, if you would type in one of these things, this might correspond to a, a person's name, you know, the one that you were that you pointed out. But that person probably doesn't want to write the name using the, um, the one that the base character corresponds to. So the variation sequence is a way to preserve that because they are not susceptible to normalization. Are they the same character in the three cases there? They're the same character, mm -hmm. but they're different glyphs. They're, various, they're variations, hence variation sequence. My laptop is it sounds like you just said the normalization breaks copy-paste. Why don't we fix the normalization routines? Because you have to fix it everywhere. That's why. Because I mean, you know, every, I mean, many different processes are going to be touching your your text data, and only one little process needs to apply normalization, and you know, like poof, the stuff is gone. I mean, it, it doesn't vanish; it just turns into this unexpectedly. And the UTC decided many many years ago that there's no way to prevent normalization. You can do it if you have a closed environment where you control all the processes. But the moment you let your data loose out in the wild, something like an Adobe app may touch it and <laughs> normalize it into the base character. That's why. This has been argued a lot. In, the <laughs> in, in extreme cases where you have characters that are encoded differently than the Unicode characters, and as long as you're entirely within an encoded character environment, and I'm thinking of Zaji in Burmese, everything yeah, works fine. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. He could have repeated the. I, I should have. I should have warned you. Sorry. Sure. I'm sorry. Uh, I think of this like I think of with an encoded character, which is not in the Unicode standard, or Burmese Zaji is a different encoding system that happens to use the same numbers for Burmese characters as. The Unicode characters, but they are different pictures. And as long as you stick within the, the Burmese Unicode space with your characters, it works fine. As long as you stick within a Zaji space for your characters, it's fine. But when you try to cross them, all hell breaks loose. Characters change pictures. And so you can't read one or the other in out of the system. I think that's kind of what you're saying. Is that right, Ken? Yeah, I think you're, you're talking about it from a different angle. but. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's interesting about the compatibility characters is uh, there's actually four types of normalization. There's four norm normalization forms, and they can affect characters differently. There's 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 the composition type that takes sequences and composes them into a single encoded character. There are also normalization forms that break apart a character into the sequence. And so what's interesting about the compatibility characters is that it doesn't matter which one is applied. It does the same thing. They all break it. They all, I mean, all all of these 
there's 1,002 compatibility characters. These are just 57. And for all 1,002, if you apply, it doesn't matter which of the four normalization forms are applied, you get these. So that's why for the compatibility characters, it was especially important to um, add these standardized variation systems. Okay. So, I mean, there's no more questions in the uh, chat pod, but, but Ryoko was further explaining how you get the proportions right by speaking from a designer's perspective. She goes, Sherry, in the determined frame, arrange the strokes so that the margins become beautiful. It is all by sensation. I could not have said it better myself. <laughs> So how many how many people here are familiar with the the, the Noto Sans sorry Noto CJK and the Source Han project? How many people have um, seen the video that we prepared for it? Ah, so we all have about ten minutes, right? <laughs> And you'll be able to see what Ryoko looks like. So one of our other designers um, in our TypeKit team actually designed this special landing page for Source on Sierra, which, by the way, recently won a award. I mean, just, just for this whole site, a special site. So very proud of um, her accomplishment. Her name is uh, Wen Ping.絵描きのものは一人のものでしかないんですけどもそのデザインをたくさんの人が使える便利なものというものがタイプフェイスデザインだと思っています本当でデジタルで書き起こすようなデザインもまずその動きを重視しながら人間の手が書き起こしているような感
before source hands, we need to choose different typeface for each region. But right now, we just got one and set the language region, and it's done. このプロジェクトの難しさなんですけども、各国がそれぞれの国で使いやすいものをデザインするということがやっぱり一番の困難を極めたところで、特に日本と中国の漢字をシェアするというところが大事なんですけども、あの、無理にシェアをしてしまえば、中国の方でちょっと日本すぎる感じが混じってきたりとか日本で中国すぎる感じが混じってきたりとかユーザーにとってあの自然でないものが上がってしまうと思うんです。Adobe is calling it Source Han Sans and the Google branded version is Noto Sans CJK Source Han Serif which Google is going to call Noto Serif CJK is the companion serif version of the typeface design. These typeface families are 100% identical. For a project like Source Han Serif, the core Latin design, Source Serif, was actually designed specifically for this project. And Frank Grieshammer, the designer who worked on it, talked to Ryoko about how do you get a fidelity between Latin and the Asian script so they could feel as coherent as we wanted them to also feel with the Japanese and the Chinese and the Korean. The scale and scope of the project is mind-boggling. For the sans serif, each weight has 65,535 glyphs. And if you multiply that by seven weights, there's just under a half million glyphs. Adobe partnered with three more foundries in Asia. And for a lot of our design reviews, we actually went out beyond our own Google employees, beyond Adobe, and we actually got reviews and feedback from other people in the community. So it was a very big effort. We actually make this free via open source, so anyone in the world can actually use the fonts that we've developed. The open source twist allows the community to engage more closely with the development process. The response has been overwhelmingly positive, and I think that's because of the quality of the typeface designs. For a region like Asia, where the typefaces are so complex, having something that can be used freely and has been built with the care and sophistication of Source Han Serif and Source Han Sans is a really big deal. Adobe revolutionized digital typography 25 years ago. The web revolutionized how people work with typefaces. And now we're looking at a revolution about what typefaces can really do within new spaces that we haven't even figured out yet. And we're pushing the boundaries of even technically what kind of typefaces you can build. This project has been amazingly successful. We're really, really happy. And we're happy with all the great work. The collaboration between us, Adobe, and everyone else has just been fantastic. We want people to have great typefaces all over the world, no matter what kind of work they're producing with it. Did anybody see the Ten Min Show Easter egg? <laughs> Did you? <laughs> Before source hands, we need to choose different type to the language region and it's done. このプロジェクトの難しさなんですけども各国がそれぞれの国で使いやすいものをデザインするということが<笑>やっぱり一番の困難を極めたところで。So, uh, does anybody have any questions? Where do you get that sweater? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? 
Everybody in the room wants one of those sweaters now, man. This is on the on the web and everything. <laughs> My wife bought this for me a couple of years ago, and and yet she's more, not. Skinny. No, more more than one person said that's a nice kind of Norwegian <laughs> Scandinavian <laughs> sweat, you know, sweater. And I think like, and I'm Viking, so yeah, I, I guess it sort of worked. Yet, who bought it? Look at that. <laughs> Oh, we got a question over here. Would you pass this? <coughs> so, is Ten Mincho, um open source? I mean, I think you mentioned that parts of it were open type. Negative. Okay, because I I hope to see it also in product design. Well, um, it's so beautiful. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, we've been focusing on open source fonts for the last I don't know, must be like 2012. Mainly because these are just massive projects that require just a phenomenal amount of work, you know, the number of glyphs and all this sort of stuff. Um, but it doesn't mean that Adobe is going to be just, you know, pumping out a whole bunch of open source fonts. We also have commercial font business. And personally, I'm, I'm glad that we are doing that, that we're all going to make these available as commercial fonts. So um, the 10 minute show fonts are actually available free through Typekit. We do have free Typekit accounts. We can actually have access to the fonts, so they're they're easily accessible. I, I just, um, I mean, beyond what's digital, I hope to see it like in print form, like keycaps on a keyboard, or used, you know, in print design as well. Well, anybody can use it for print design. Uh, so I mean, that that's one of the licensing. Uh, that's what the license grants you, that you can produce material using font. I mean, any, that, that's true of any font, that you can produce materials. Uh, it's just that, you, just that you cannot embed the font itself in your product. You can do that for open source fonts because the open source license allows you to do that. But commercial fonts do not allow you to do that. You can make PDFs, you can make other collateral, or even printed. Um, pretty much every, every font allows you to do that. Let's see. Any more questions on the Connect? There was a lot of appreciation of the video on there. Oh, good. Norway. <laughs> that was about the sweater. <laughs> <laughs> Look what I started. There's, there weren't enough questions from this side of the room. What do we got here? So is, is there a difference between Vikings and Norwegians? Vikings are actually Danish. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, well, my Viking ancestors came from Norway. But um, the, the, best way, the best way to say or to claim, the best way to claim that Vikings are not Norwegians, you can't interchange them, is that the the small town I grew up in in uh, Wisconsin, uh, Greater Metropolitan Mount Horeb population 4,000, um, the team mascot was Vikings. So you can't call the Mount Horeb varsity <laughs> football team the Mount Horeb Norwegians. You know, it comes out better as Mount Horeb Vikings. You know, like, you're actually going to do something. So, sorry about that. Um, any other questions? I don't see anything else from the, the Connect session for the remote people. Uh, apologies if this is like too broad, but like there's a lot of us here sort of new to all of this. And do you think you can describe in real broad strokes like the, the process of just like making a new font like from inception to like creating it and like putting it out and everything it seems like such like a big undertaking well this is when you want to have a designer speaking i'm not a designer mm -hmm. so i take the um the glyphs that the designer produces and i make them into a form that can be used by me. so that means you know, putting all the glyphs you know together um 
defining all the features, defining all the variation sequences, all of the encoding stuff. So I do all that work. So I make all the ubiquitous functional. But um, I mean, to really do a, a, a good typeface can take years. You know, from kind of you know, the initial the concept uh, to making a uh, sort of a keyword that has a small number of glyphs, where you're just trying to see if it's going to work, to making something that's fully functional. And for something like a Japanese font, it takes a little bit longer time because you have to design, you know, almost 7,000 kanji. So there's just you know, there's there's a workload um, issue there. But I think all in all, um, Yoko can has, has answer this better than I can. But I think this has been at least two years, possibly more. Thank you. Can you take lessons learned from past fonts that you've made and potentially speed that process up at all? Do you see Japanese fonts? Because like, when you gave your history, it sounds like it is like every couple of years that a new one comes out, which is really impressive. But do you, do you ever see there being a process where like it's really easy to do that? Like I, I feel like you can go on the internet and buy like an English font for like five dollars essentially, like and, and really quickly do it because obviously there's only twenty six plus, you know, numbers, whatever else. But like, do you see the Jap do you ever see the characters becoming more like like easier to process, I guess? You mean easier to design? Not easier to design necessarily, but maybe like once like do you ever see like a basis for glyphs becoming like like do you see the programming side becoming easier? Just taking like I don't know. Well, like, I mean, well, I've been at Adobe almost 27 years, and I can tell you just flat out that the tools that we have for developing fonts are just light years ahead of what we had when I first joined Adobe. So just, you know, the way that we can, um, the way that we can test fonts, the way that we can inspect the inside of fonts, you know, for various consistencies and things like that. And uh, even like, for example, the way that we that we name glyphs based on Unicode, um, that was a lifesaver for the pan CJK type. Just made um, all the subsequent processing easier because I cannot associate um, the glyph name with something in Unicode, which is, you know, I mean, these days, if you're doing something that's not Unicode, you're doing it the wrong way. So I think I think Unicode has um, it's been a um, a big help along the way as well. Even though the tools have advanced, the functionality of Hang the on, is greatly yes. increased. So I, I was just going to let you comment on that as well. Actually, I actually have one more Unicode comment. Um, so is anybody here in the room a member of Unicode? Individual member? Just two? OK. Um, I'm going to call out text here, sorry. Um, so up until. Uh, I think end of January, early February, um, Unicode offered individual life memberships on an annual basis. And I put a suggestion in um, to the officers back in September to offer lifetime memberships for people like me who you know don't want to worry about you know paying something every year. Um, so they, they finally approved that um, end of January and I became the first lifetime member. And for individual members that had, I think, 15 or more years, like text, were granted lifetime membership as well. So right now, um, that was, I believe, I think there were seven of those type of members that got granted lifetime membership. And then I was the first paid lifetime member, and there's been two subsequent ones since then. And um, I'm the I'm Adobe's primary representative to Unicode. That's why I attend all the, the Unicode technical committee. And I had like no, no no motivation whatsoever to become an individual member because as long as I work for Adobe, you know, I'm I'm effectively a member of Unicode. But um, and they even had they even had a um, deal where if you paid for 10 years in advance, they gave you a 20% discount. So instead of paying 750, you paid like 600. Anyway, um, something like 600, and then, but then 10 years later, I got to worry about this again. But um, so I, I guess what I'm saying is that um, 
iMug offers lifetime memberships, $100. And starting this year, Unicode is offering lifetime memberships as well for anybody who's interested in plunking down 750 bucks. So, Once again, iMug leads the way. <laughs> so do you get to choose your own glyph with your lifetime membership? <laughs> no, that, that's for character adoptions. Not for membership. You get, you get a nice, Let's just throw that in. You get a nice um, uh, membership. PDF thing. <laughs> That's the Unicode logo. Yes. And that comes with a sweater, right? Uh, <laughs> not this sweater. A different sweater. Hey, uh, what Ken's not saying is now he expects me to pay him 75 bucks a year. <laughs> so um, if there's no other uh, questions or comments, uh, thank you for taking the time to come here and listen to all this. Thank you, Ken.